Hey there, I'm Jason Gotts, and you're listening to Think Again, a Big Think podcast. Since the early days of the public internet, Big Think has curated more than 10,000 powerful ideas and shared them through video, text, and social media. The Think Again podcast takes us in a different direction, out of our comfort zone, surprising me and my guests with conversation topics we didn't necessarily come here prepared to discuss. I'm very happy to be here today with Jody Pico. She's the number one New York Times bestselling author of 23 novels, including Leaving Time, The Storyteller, Lone Wolf, and My Sister's Keeper. Jody's latest novel, Small Great Things, has deep personal resonance for her and has been many years in the making. It deals with racism in America today, both in the explicit form of a white supremacist character and the implicit racism that results from class privilege. Welcome to Think Again, Jody. Thank you so much. So, um, I mean, I guess let's start with the elephant in the room, which is that we are two white people here yes. about to talk about racism in America. I yeah. sort of wish that we had um, a person of color with us, Tanahasi Coates, or awesome. Jelani yeah. Cobb, who's going to be here later in the week to kind of bounce these things <laughs> off of too. But, but so we will come at it from where we're coming at it from. But um, right. I wonder if you know. If you want to start um, with an overview of, a brief overview of what the book is about, and, sure. then, and then a little bit about why it was important to you to write. You sure. Know, you have not yeah. Yeah, ahead. I'm actually going to flip the order of that. That's but, perfect. <laughs> yeah, so 25 years ago, I really wanted to write about racism. I tend to write about the things that upset me the most. And I had been living in New York City when there was uh, an undercover African-American cop who was shot four times in the back by his white colleagues, even though he was wearing the color of the day, which signified him as an undercover cop. And this right. happened on the subway. It totally upset me. And I started to write a book, and I tried really, really hard, and I failed. And it was because I couldn't create an authentic voice. I couldn't create an authentic story. And you know, I really second-guessed myself, saying, as you just brought up, what right do I have as a white woman to write about racism when I've had all the privilege in yeah. the world growing up? Right. And I stepped away from it. And over the years, I would, I would question myself, kind of playing devil's advocate. And I would say, OK, well, wait a second. You know, you write all the time in the voice of people you're not. You write as men. You write as rape victims. You write as Holocaust survivors, as school shooters. You're none of those right. people either. So what is different about this? And you know, it took me a while to realize what is different about this is racism. It's very hard to talk about without offending someone. And so as a result, many of us choose not to speak about it at all. Right. So fast forward to 2012. And again, I found another news story that captures my attention. It is a nurse, an African-American nurse in Michigan, who uh, has 25 years of labor and delivery experience. She helps deliver a baby. And uh, in the aftermath, the father of the baby calls in her supervisor and says, I don't want her or anyone who looks like her to touch my kid. And he pushes up his sleeve to reveal a swastika tattoo. Right. He was a skinhead. In their infinite wisdom, and I say that in quotes, the hospital put a post-it note in the baby's file saying no African-American personnel to touch this infant. The nurse wound up suing. She settled out of court. I hope she got a giant payout. But it made me think, well, what if? What if I could push the envelope and right. create a novel around this? What if there was this African-American nurse that this happened to, but she was the only person in the room when something happened to the baby? What if she had to choose between following her supervisor's orders or saving this baby's life? What if, as a result of that, she winds up on trial with a white public defender who, like me, like many of my friends, would never call herself a racist. And what if I could use those three voices, the African-American nurse, the white public defender, and the white supremacist, to tell the story and to have them all challenge their beliefs about race and privilege and power. And it was like this aha moment for me. I suddenly knew I was going to actually be able to finish this book. And the reason was twofold. My intent was different, and my audience was different. Right. I wasn't trying to write a story about racism to tell people of color how hard their lives are. Like you said, I have no right to do that, and that never will be my story to tell. Right. But I was writing because I needed to tell other white people, hey, you know, it's really easy to point to the skinhead and say, oh, there's a racist. It's a lot harder to point to yourself and say the same thing. And yet, you know, because racism isn't just about prejudice, it's also about power and privilege, we are part of the problem as white people, even if we're not talking about it. Not choosing to talk about race 
is a privilege in and of itself. Right. I mean, you have a very big and like mainstream audience in America, yes. among whom I would imagine there are a lot of white people mm -hmm. who might be uncomfortable as, mm -hmm. you know, even some of the white people I grew up around are with ta Coates' latest book sure. and any, any, you know, Black Lives Matter and Absolutely. whatever, and who when these things are discussed just start saying, well, that's, so, you know, get be very totally. defensive. Yeah. Totally. And, you know, it's funny, I've already done a couple of interviews for this book, and I literally spent a three-hour trip from one venue at one event to another basically doing personal social justice workshops over email with white men who were upset with some of the things that I had said. And, you know, that's okay, because one of the first things you learn when you, when you start studying racial justice, which is new to me, you know? Right. This is a journey I just started, and God knows I have a long way to go, but we're all at different points, and that's okay. And, you know, one of the first things you learn is that it is important to talk to your own kind. And just like ta Coates in his brilliant book makes it very clear that this is intended for people of color, right. you know, I guess what I'm saying is the audience I'm trying to really reach here would be, like you said, those white people who I think really do want to enter this conversation and do want to make the world a better place, but don't have the vocabulary or the wherewithal to know how to start talking about racism. Yeah, no, I mean, we would want, I guess, though, to get to a point where we don't have to think about like being mm -hmm. one kind or another, you 100%. know, talking to, yeah. But we're so far away from that yeah, right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's yeah, part yeah. of the problem. Yeah. And and the thing that gets me the most is like, you know, honestly, when I, and, and I judge myself too, I should say this, that I, I don't mean to judge anybody else because I was this person a couple of years ago, but people often, white people, I'm, I, I, that I meet say things that they think are the right thing to say, but that couldn't be more wrong. Right. You know, like this is in your book, these sort of like death yeah. by a thousand cuts right. of Ruth's white, yeah. white friends who are saying right. things to her. Like, One of my favorite lines in the book is when Ruth narrates and says, white people don't mean half the stupid things that come out of their mouth, you know? Right. And that's great because it, it is true. And, and honestly, people of color cut us a lot of slack all the time, you know, but I would love to get to a point where people of color and white people can have honest conversations about race. We're not quite there yet. And so right now, I think it really is important that right. that if you if you are white, like I'm white, you know, you get to go out and say to other people who may not have figured this out yet, hey, you gotta look a little more closely at yourself. It took me a while because, you know, I'm half Jewish and I very much identify with the Jewish side of my family and I know the history and I spent a lot of time sure. thinking about what my ancestors in the not too distant past went through. And so in my 20s, I think it was, I was living in DC and I was working at Living Stage, which is a social outreach arm of Arena Stage. Oh, cool. And we were doing workshops. Yeah. Um, the, and, and the cast were mostly black and Latino. And I was sort of in like a peripheral support kind of ambiguous role. Yeah. And there'd be like workshops with, you know, mostly black kids from DC. And it was, you know, it was uncomfortable, like coming to terms with like, A, what is my role in this situation? Do I even belong here? Do I have anything to say or add? Mm -hmm. But also with just systemic racism and the fact that totally. like you can't help it. You know? Right, totally. And, you know, it's really, there are a couple things I would say to that. The yeah, first yeah. is that being put in those situations where you're not in the majority in a room is so important. And a lot of white people, I don't, I don't think they ever have that opportunity, right. or they don't, they don't go out of their way to make that opportunity. One of my favorite things to do is to be on tour in South Africa, mm. because although there certainly are still a lot of white people in South Africa, when you look around the media there and you look at billboards and posters and magazines, the standard of beauty is very much a black standard of beauty. Right. Which is so cool. Oh, I mean, I, I just always feel, wow, this is very otherworldly to me when I'm down there and I like it. Yeah. But by the same token, one of the first times that I was in a space where I was not in the majority was at this racial justice workshop that I went to. And of course, I went in there thinking, I'm a good person. I'm open minded, you know. Right. And I left every night in tears. For me, the most moving parts of the workshop were really hearing stories of situations I will never have to live. Right. So like there was this one girl who was an Asian American girl who talked about her love hate affair with eyeliner and how she was in tears talking about how she couldn't use it easily on her own features but that was the standard of beauty in which she grew up. Oh, wow. And there was another young woman who was an African American woman who talked about how 
exhausting it is to wake up every day and to have to put a mask on, a metaphorical mask, to be the kind of black person that white people can handle. And how tiring that was and how she never was herself. And like, you know, it was really like light bulbs going off, firecrackers in my head going, you have never had to feel this, you will never have to feel this. You know, and that, that was really, for me, a sea change. I mean, I just turned 50. I literally spent, you know, 47 years of my life not paying a lot of attention to race right. because I didn't have to. One of the other great things I did when I was researching the book was talk to multiple women of color for over 100 hours of interview tape. Right. Because let's be realistic, I don't have the right to write the voice of Ruth. I never will be a black woman in America. And if I was going to do it because of what I was trying to say desperately, I had to do my homework. And I met with these un just wonderful ladies who basically overlooked my ignorance about their own lives <laughs> and spent all this time telling me about their hopes and their fears and their successes and their failures. There was this one mom who came in and she had had this baby recently and she spoke to me and said, it was after another unarmed black man was shot by the police. It yeah. was the morning after. And she came in all upset and said, how am I gonna protect my son? How do I teach him to grow up and not be black? Gotcha. And how do you answer that? You know, how on earth do you answer that? And it was like a devastating beginning to a conversation. These women, they vetted the voice of Ruth for me. They read the manuscript. They made changes so that it would sound as authentic as, as possible, given that I was a white woman writing it. You know, and I couldn't have and should not have written the book, really, without their help. Yeah, I mean, black people in this country have been explaining for a long Forever, time to yeah. white people what right. they're going through. Right. You so know? this is my favorite thing I'm doing on tour. Um, so I've, been, I've done a bunch of events so far, and at every event, I say to a group of people who are predominantly white, raise your hand if you know who Rosa Parks is. And you know, everyone raises their hand. And then I go, raise your hand if you know who Lewis Latimer is. Mm. And maybe I get one person to raise their hand. And I'm like, you go, good for you. And then I say, all the rest of you, that's your homework. Find out who he is, and then ask yourself why your education did not cover that. Right. You know, and that's really important. I didn't know these things until I started digging. But it is on us. It's on us to start digging. It's not up to people of color to explain it to us. Totally. I mean, the last thing I want to say as, you know, a guilty white liberal who is aware of systemic racism and mm -hmm. and feels very unhappy mm -hmm. about it, have especially having grown up mm -hmm. completely obsessed with, I mean, that aspect of black modern culture, which is early hip hop and the stuff I was listening, you know, Beat Street, Break right. In, whatever, trying to break dance myself <laughs> as a kid, you know, and being like the outsider within my little mostly white private school. You know, it's troubling to me to think that we are in two completely divided cultures and I and I want like I kind of yearn for that connection across the lines, mm -hmm. you know. But I read Tanahasi's book and I felt like, okay, this is me, this is us, this is what's going on with mm -hmm. us. And you can't quite understand, you know. Right. And so I had a really interesting experience with Tanahasi's book because it was another growth experience for me. So I read this book and I was blown away and I went out and bought 10 copies and gave them out to people mm. who I thought needed to read them. And I was talking to a friend of mine who is a woman of color and I said, that book absolutely wrecked me. And I said, I really, you know, I mean, on Twitter, everyone's connected. So I'm like, I'm going to write to him and I'm going to tell him, you know, that I really love this book. And it was just about then that he was tweeting and saying, great, I'm thrilled all these white critics are giving me awards. I do not care. <laughs> I was like, I was like, whoa, yeah. whoa, wait. And he said, you know, that's awesome, um, great, but this book was not for you. And it was really interesting because I went back to my friend and I was like, I, I, don't, I mean, I guess I'm not going to write to him now because he doesn't care if I liked it. And then, and then I thought, you know, but why? You know, as a writer, I would certainly want to know if someone liked my book. And she broke it all down for me. She goes, uh, can I just stop you right there? <laughs> It's not about you. And I was like, oh, God, yes, right. I forgot right, about right. that. It's but, and not that, about And that me. whole process, though, yes. of like the, sort of the ego getting kind of offended by How like, why won't they what want to talk to yes. me about this? You know, and it's like, yeah. And no, it's totally <laughs> right, not. Right, right, right. I was right, like, right. no, it's not about me. And yes, he did an amazing thing. And then I kind of sat back and I sat with that for a second. 
And I thought, okay, no, it's not all about me. And two, this really made, gave me validation because I was in the middle of writing this book. And I was like, I was sitting here struggling with the idea that here I am writing about racism. I'm a white woman. I do want to talk to the people who look like me and right. say, wake up a little. And I'm talking to my own audience. And here I have someone I very much admire, ta Coates, saying, yes, write to your own audience. And I was like, okay, I learned that from you. I'm going to do it, you know, and I felt really good about it. That that makes perfect sense, and that actually is a perfect um, segue. I'm gonna I'm gonna just read the last paragraph of something I was just reading by Tanahasi, uh -huh. uh, which I think speaks to why it's a, not only okay but good Important. that you wrote your book. Mm -hmm. It's from an Atlantic article called "The Black Journalist and the Racial Mountain." And uh, he says, I think there are reasons to write beyond placing a thumb in the eye of white liberals who are not our gods and who are not our slaves. And then he says, by the lights of history, the collective white conscience has never needed salve, has made no apologies, and has proven impervious to the import of black literature. Mm -hmm. It's almost as though writers should write for themselves, should hew to their own standards and keep their own conscience instead of fretting over the feelings of those who they cannot change and who they do not mm. control. So, That's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, and it's funny because I, I agree with that, um, this makes me actually think of Lionel Shriver and the controversy that's yes, been going on yes, about the right to write. Yes, I've been thinking about that as we've been preparing to yeah. talk. Yeah. And you know, honestly, nobody told Lionel Shriver, in my opinion, you can't write this. You can't write other. I mean, it's ridiculous to think that anyone would censor writers of really any color and say, you must write within your own lines. Right. I don't think that's the job of the writer, and I don't actually think anyone thinks that's the job of the writer. And I really believe that what she was railing against in totally the wrong way was was the idea that we should be held accountable. If you are going to write other, you need to ask yourself two questions. You need to say, why am I doing this? Is it to profit off somebody else's pain? Right. You know, make money off that, and it's not my story, but I'm going to, you know, get some green off it. Or is it because there's something viscerally I need to tell, and this is the only way I can do it, is by writing this particular voice? Right. And if that's the answer, then you, you go to step B, which is, how can I write a voice that is not mine with empathy and with insight and with compassion? Right. That is really all any author should have to do and should strive for, honestly. And even having done that, if someone wants to come and say, you know what, you got it wrong, then you got to be ready to deal with That's that. That's it. Yeah, if like, you yeah, get into like, the yeah, kitchen, yeah. you got to face <laughs> right, the heat. Right, right. And you know what? I, I yeah. will. I have. And I will continue to. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's part of my message. You know, I'm willing right. to kind of be... I'm going to be the sacrificial lamb here. If you want to have a problem with something I've written, I'm going to take it and I'm going to listen to you and I'm going to learn from it, hopefully, or I'm going to explain to you why I did what I did. But ultimately, one of the things that keeps white people from talking about racism is a paralytic fear of making a mistake. Right. And it's much more important to talk and know that you probably will make a mistake and then apologize, learn from it, and move forward than to not say anything at all. I agree 100%. And speaking of talking about things that one may or may not know anything about, that brings us to the second part of the show where we listen to the <laughs> surprise video clips. I say listen because the audience will hear them, but you and I will see them and discuss them. The first one is by C. Nicole Mason, who I believe is a social activist and also a novelist. Let's see what it is. The issue I see with the, in the election right now is that we're not having the conversations that matter to people and families across the country. We have moved so far away from the bread and butter issues that families want to talk about. So we haven't heard a lot about poverty. We haven't heard a lot in this election about making sure that we have a strong social safety net, not only for low-income families, but for middle-class families who are still fragile or straddling between being financially secure and close to the edge in terms of falling into poverty. And we're just not having those conversations. We're talking about things that matter, but when we talk about building a society where all people have a fair shot, we're not talking about the issues that will make the difference for them. We don't talk a lot about white poverty, and I think we should because I think if we talked a lot more about the way poverty Im impacts different groups, I think we would not see it as a, an issue that's out there and doesn't impact me or it's a black issue or a Latino issue. Um, we would see it as an issue of lack and people not having the resources that they need to be able to live a quality and a productive life. What 
frightens me is that there's not enough moral responsibility for others in our society. And so we can just turn our back. We can say, hey, that's not me. That doesn't impact me or that's happening to them and not to me and not seeing the connection between us all. What are you thinking? As what you're I'm thinking that? is I wish that my husband and daughter were with me because <laughs> um, my husband uh, works and is on the board of a local homeless shelter where I live. Okay. And my daughter spent the summer as a social work intern working with these families in poverty. Oh, okay. And you know what I can tell you is that my book is about a woman who has been skating right below the surface of the white upper middle class for as long as she can, even though she's black. Right. Um, I'm not. She's right. educated. She got her nursing degree right. at Yale. Like. But everything she's done has, and even living in a white suburb of a diverse town like New Haven, right. everything she's done is in the hopes that her son can have what she considers to be the perfect life, which is actually, that's a whole different issue because what a mom might think is perfect might not be what her son would envision to be as sure. perfect. And one of the issues that comes up in the book is that Edison, who is this young African-American boy who has white friends and has gone to grade schools, is coming up against, oh, it's okay that you're my friend, but you're not dating my sister, that kind of thing, which right. happens to a lot of, I think, kids in that environment uh, who are, are kids of color. What she's talking about, though, that really resonated with me was an intersectionality. And one of the things that um, when you start to think about racial justice and you start to think about uh, systemic and institutional racism is how you absolutely cannot divorce it from socioeconomics. Right. It's literally like making a peanut butter jelly sandwich and then trying to take it apart and getting the, the jelly and the peanut butter separate again. There's always going to be a little of some on the other side. In, in the England of a couple generations ago, this was classism. I mean, it still yes. to some extent is, but like right. it was a majority white society, but right. you had the sort of unbridgeable class barriers. You know? and, and one of the great arguments that I think you often hear from privileged people when they are talking about how clearly we must be in a post-racial society, <laughs> um, which is not true, uh, is that, you know, well, there are poor white people too. Well, there are poor white homeless people, you know, so, what about them? Well, you know there are studies that have been done on this. And if you are a homeless white person, you still will get more money in your can than a homeless black person. Right. And more people on your street, on the street, will, will shy away from a homeless black man than they would a homeless yeah, white man. Yeah, and if you really want to take it to the mat on that argument, I mean, the statistics are like extreme. You know, the percentage of black Americans living in poverty is insanely Huge. higher than that of white Americans. Exactly. Graduation rates, et cetera, et cetera. Right, and yeah. I mean, and honestly, if you really want to unpack that, you have to go back to slavery. Right. And the devastating effects of that on generations of families. Yeah. You know, and, and honestly, when you think about a homeless family that is trying to get its feet back underneath them, you know, their, their concept of saving is very different than what someone in the middle class is going to have when it comes to savings. They're, right. you know, they're going to be thinking really of of living hand to mouth. That if you have extra money, resources, you buy something right away with it because you may never have that money again. Right. You know, and so when you begin to compound that by generations of poverty, which you know grew out really of a post-slavery era, all of a sudden it's exponential. I mean, you can't undo the two. And what I do agree with hugely that she says though right. is this concept that it is everybody's problem. I'm also going to be the first one to tell you that we are not talking about things that matter in this election at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We can't, let's not even begin that yeah, I, don't, I don't know. But, <laughs> um, even want to talk yes, about the exactly. things we actually are talking about. Exactly. But I do think that when she says this isn't just a black problem, I think that really is is sort of the entry point that I came into anti-racism with the idea that when you only hear people of color talking about racism and how it affects them in a way and this is horrible I'm the first one to say this in a way you just become almost deaf to it sure you know it's a little bit like how honestly like I how feel about school shootings there have been so many that they blend together that is a horrible it's a horrible thought. state of affairs right. yeah and you know and the same thing when you hear people who are oppressed, complaining about the oppression, sometimes you don't listen, which is, again, a horrible state of affairs. Sometimes it takes that one unexpected voice to speak out that makes you realize, wait, what? 
and catches your attention. And honestly, the best way that I can describe this, I have my oldest son is gay, and I, you know, after all all the rhetoric about why there should be gay rights in this country, right. what is it? What what makes people sit up and take notice when a Republican senator says something? You know, because it's not right. what you would expect the Republican senator to say. And when he says, "Yeah, we ought to have gay marriage," all of a sudden, everyone goes, "Wait, what? Huh?" So in a way, I do believe exactly what she says. It is everyone's problem. I mean, part of this, I think, is also Ameri it's foundational to America and to the some aspect of the American dream, right? We start as a country of pioneers, mm -hmm. of rugged individualists. We are not a collectivist society. So ideas of giving a damn about everybody mm -hmm. are to some extent imported to us via European socialism mm -hmm. later, like it's sort of the labor movements in the 30s. You know, right. in a way it's like, there's something fundamentally American about being like, damn it, I'm gonna take care of my own and you mm -hmm. take care of your own, and, right. right? And like, that's hard to shake, I think. But it also comes back to that idea of that American dream and something you said earlier about guilt, you know, this white guilt. Right. And, you know, there is this sense that if you if you decide to think about all of us together instead of just what's good for me, right. that you are losing something. You have to give something up. Right. And you know, when you are white in America, you hold all the advantages. Who wants to give away the winning card, right? But there is this very subtle and seismic shift in thinking. If you can make yourself understand that if we tackle all this together, if we begin to unpack and dismantle racism together, yeah. we actually all win. Right. That's the difference. But you know what? And and that's right. And let's go there in a different way. My sure. my son, who's eight years old, almost nine, there's a homeless woman, maybe she's 35, something like that, who stays in the train station near where we live. And he's befriended her. He goes to her every time. Hi, how are you? He talks to her. And I talk, I say hi to her as well, but peripherally because of him, it wouldn't, it probably wouldn't have happened. Right. And he asked me the other day, like, why can we give her five thousand dollars for Christmas or something? Like, can we just fix her thing? You know? Yeah. And I had to like sit there and take a deep breath and be like, why can I? Why is the answer no? You know, because mm -hmm. the argument of like, well, if we help her and then we help all of them, then we won't right. have anything. Like that doesn't really feel very satisfying, right? Right. right. Yeah, and that is that's a really hard, <laughs> again that's a really hard thing. But it, I, I'm thinking about Sammy doing her social work internship right. and saying that, you know, so much of success is not one moment of success, especially when you have been in homeless. That it's that the next time when you fall, you fall less deep. And the way that you do that is by having skills and resources that right. are given to you or taught to you in some capacity, hopefully through an organization like the one that you know that my daughter was working for, right. so that you can begin to get your own feet under you. And the next time, it's not quite as far a fall. That reminds me, I actually heard um, Killer Mike, the ra Atlanta rapper Killer Mike was on, um, I guess this was an older clip from the Colbert Report when that was still on. And Colbert was like, speaking for all white people, what can we do? You know, sort of thing. And, and, and Killer Mike said, volunteer to mentor African-American youth and mm -hmm. give them some of the, if they don't have it, give them, share with them some of the skills that you mm -hmm. have about like applying to college and whatever. Now, mm -hmm. from a, my white guilt perspective, that like smacks of like noblesse oblige. Yeah, I don't want to like, I don't want to yeah. like ghost. <laughs> You yeah. know, I feel bad about, like, am I, I'm going to go rescue everybody. But that was what Killer Mike had to say. He was like, yeah. share some of your white privilege, you know, right. like share the skills. You yeah. Know? I mean, I, I tend to think that a really good way to kind of get, get rid of that white guilt is um, think about how can you, you, you can't change it. You're, you're going to stay white. I hate to Guilty. tell you this, yeah, but yeah. you're always going to be white. Yeah. So how can you use that? And in a way that is helpful. And of Productive, course, yeah. right, like you said, I don't think it, it is a savior thing. I don't think you're supposed to ever go in and say, let me tell you how to fix your lives. Right. Because let me tell you this, communities of color know what they're doing and they've got great leaders on their own. But what here's what you do have. When you're white, everybody wants to listen to your opinion. And I don't know why that is, but people actually care what you have to say. And, you know, there's this kind of metaphorical microphone that I think about. And if you are able to, as a white person with an audience in any 
in any venue, even if it's a board meeting, you know, and there are just 10 people sitting around the table, if you're able to tap that metaphorical mic and say, um, excuse me, is everyone listening? Great. And then pass it to somebody whose voice isn't heard. Mm. Or, you know, be the guy in the conference room who says, we haven't heard from so-and-so yet. Right. Maybe, you know, maybe it is a woman of color in the corner who hasn't talked yet because right. people are talking over her. I don't know. But make sure that other people's voices are somehow heard. One of the things that I love about going out on a tour for Small Great Things is that I've been telling people, finish this book and then go right back to a bookstore and find a voice of color. How often do you read an author of color? There are so many incredible authors of color. And honestly, if you really want to know more about what it means to be black in America, do not listen to <laughs> Jody Pico. Listen to someone who's been living it. Right, right, you know, right, and right. so the idea that as an author, one of the things I can do with my privilege is steer people to voices that they haven't heard is really important to me. That makes sense. Shall we see what the next surprise clip I is? I can't wait. Okay, nor, nor can I. It is Critic A.O. Scott, and the video is titled, Are Comedians More Intellectual Than Politicians? I feel like if, if you want to see, you know, anti-intellectualism um, uh, on full display, you can watch some presidential debates. I mean, you can certainly look, look at look at our political discourse and see, well, you know, thought and intellect is not held in, in the highest value. And uh, that concerns me a lot. There is, you know, uh, a tradition. Uh, Richard Hofstadter wrote a book uh, probably 50 years ago now or more called Anti-Intellectualism in American Life, um, where he identified this strain in politics and civic life of, you know, mistrust of expertise, of suspicion of, of knowledge or of thought or of irony or of nuance. And I think in culture and the arts, there's, there's a lot of that too. There's a lot of spoon feeding. There's a, there's a lot that's just sort of easy. And I think that it's important to recognize and to reward and encourage opposition to that, which can come in, in different places. I mean, I think there are champions of intellect and intelligence out there in the world. A lot of them are comedians. I mean, I think we do live at a time where, you know, people like Jon Stewart or Larry Wilmore or Chris Rock or Amy Schumer or, uh, or Lena Dunham, you know, are, are, are out there kind of saying, well, look, let's be smart. Let's think. Let's, like, not take things for granted. Let's not just accept what's given to us. So I'm actually going to go, I think, in a different direction with this. You've said some really interesting things on, like, from a, a twist on this this mm -hmm. topic, right? So yeah, yeah. Um, I, mean, <laughs> I was first, hoping you were going to go there. Yeah. First of all, you know, you yeah, you um, used to write for Wonder Woman, so sure. you know the whole like comic books, high culture, low culture divide there, mm -hmm. you know, in American history. And then I know you famously kind of got into it with uh, or around Franzen. Right. And the fact that Jonathan Franzen's book was reviewed twice in the New York Times. Plus and, a style piece. Okay, too. <laughs> right, Same right. Same week, yeah. Right. So I'm, you know, I'm coming at this, like, my background is sort of as a, as a culture snob, like a lit snob, mm -hmm. like Nabokov, Shakespeare, whatever. Right. I, like, made myself read all the dead greats, you know, mm -hmm. before any modern writers. But I, I'm really interested to hear, like, you know, more about your your take on that divide, kind of, in the publishing industry and in the culture at large. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, first of all, let Based me start, on, yeah, 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 coming off of this. Yeah. Let me start with comics because it's interesting you bring them up. Yeah. You realize, of course, that comics are often the leading edge when it comes to social justice, and that we've had gay characters and gay marriages in comics and black characters way before we've had them in other incarnations of pop culture, which is really cool. Wonder Woman, case in point. <laughs> yes, yeah, right. right. <laughs> you know, Green Lantern. I mean, all of these things. That's a very interesting, you know, association. But what I immediately started thinking about was, of course, the divide between literary and commercial fiction. Right. And that is pretty much a marketing tool more than anything else. You know, traditionally, commercial fiction sells really well and is not well written. That's the general belief. Right. And literary fiction is well written and wins prizes, but nobody gets rich off it. <laughs> right. I would argue that both of those are false. I read everything. I have read lots of literary fiction that is extraordinary. And I've also read lots of literary fiction that is navel gazing and that I don't think really merits the praise that it gets. Sure. On the other hand, there is some really bad commercial fiction out there. <laughs> I am the first person to tell you that. But commercial fiction does something really extraordinary. It reaches people. 
it reaches the people who aren't reading Shakespeare and the greats and Aeschylus and you know all the the traditional highbrow literature right the translated Polish tomes that are in the New York Times <laughs> book review on weekends people who are not reading that will go pick up a piece of commercial fiction right and here's the other thing commercial fiction if it's done right and done well in my opinion reaches more people but also has the ability to teach more people because you can write a book that is about a very thorny difficult social justice or social issue and have your reader think you're telling them a story I'm going right. for a ride I get these characters I want to see what happens there's gonna be a twist this is gonna be awesome and if you do your job right they close the book and they're still thinking about that issue Right. You know, where you're not going to go and have a reader probably go and pick up a book like the, they're not going to go read the FBI report on school shooters, okay? Right. But I did, and I used that when I wrote 19 Minutes, which is about bullying and school shooters and gun culture in the U.S. And people who read that book were haunted by it. Educators still use it when they are teaching to other educators. Mm -hmm. It's been used in numerous high schools across the country and I hear from teachers all the time saying, we never have discussions in classes like the ones we have with that book. I think that is what commercial fiction can do. It is this backdoor entry into the issues that are hard to talk about in reality. Interesting. And I really do feel that about, about this book, about small great things. So that's interesting. Well, I, that's really interesting that you uh, say that because, and you have a, I know you have a master's from Harvard in education, mm -hmm. so you've got an education background, and right. so you see a storytelling, but also a didactic function. In, I see in commercial. My world like. is a classroom. Okay. I mean, I actually think I'm still a teacher. Right. It's just a really, really big class. Right. And thank God I don't have to write, you know, grades for all of them. <laughs> yeah. right. But it really is to me. That is why I write. Mm. I write because I need to understand something, and if I can understand it, I can explain it to That's other people. And so, for me, the art of fiction mm. is that it allows a, a wide swath of people, commercial fiction, right. it allows people from all different levels of reading and corners of the world to approach a topic that they think is going to be entertainment, right. and that turns out to be education. I think what's interesting, so I think bad commercial fiction, or at least what intellectuals maybe like A.O. Scott think of bad commercial fiction, and he's certainly watched his share of <laughs> horrific movies, movies and right? so, um, uh, uh, the criticism of it, the main criticism is that it is reinforcing the prejudices and the sort of ignorance that people already hold, right? So you're saying mm -hmm. the good commercial fiction can shift that. right? I guess literary writers, you know, I'm thinking of my darlings, you know, Nabokov or, you know, someone like that, like they would probably balk at any kind of like didactic function. They wouldn't want to be seen as educators. They, or they'd want their education to be oblique, like they're problematizing your reality and your way of thinking. <laughs> I you think know? they want to be seen as chroniclers of the human condition. Right. And take from it what you will. Right. You know, I, right. I guess I would like to believe I have a slightly more active role in the process. Right. But you know, I, I think that I think that's okay. I think he what A.O. Scott is also saying though, right. is you know, that you've got first of all, I didn't know he looked like that. But, <laughs> uh, but <laughs> you've got you've got comedians nowadays right. who are in a way, the most cutting edge intellectual response we have to some of what's going on in society. And I think of Samantha Bee, who is my own personal hero these days. Right. I love her. Right. And she can get away with saying what we're all thinking because it's entertainment. Well, that's right. And comedians cut through that divide. I mean, they're like, no one would think of comedians as intellectuals. And so it's very interesting that they're assuming that role, yeah, a right. public intellectual. I mean, and what I'm arguing is we shouldn't lump all literary fiction as being brilliant and we shouldn't lump all commercial fiction as being trash right. because I don't think that's the case. Do you think that the existence of those categories and the kind of marketing machinery that is behind them creates traps for writers that kind of silo them sometimes in one direction or another in terms of the structures of what they're trying to 100%, write. hundred percent. Like, yeah. Because I can tell you, I still remember the day that I was basically told to choose a path. Uh, yeah? Your yeah, because it was, it was a marketing decision. Said, yeah. 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 They said, you can either revise the book so it's more like this, or you can revise the book so it's more like this. And I decided, I mean, I remember distinctly thinking, well, I would, ra I know I'm going to write the same book. 
so I might as well reach more people. Mm. You know, and that was the choice that I made. Interesting. You know, it probably means I'm going to go out and live and say I probably never will win a National Book Award. But right. so be it. You right. know, because I do believe that there are people who are coming to my books, are learning something, and are leaving changed. And I would like to argue that that is the entire point of fiction in general. I think that's right. I agree with that. And, and indeed, you may well end up, because of this book, as kind of the therapist to, <laughs> to, to white people trying to overcome racism. Okay, yeah, the, the, the reluctant therapist. Yes, it but, may and happen. So. The unqualified therapist, but yeah. It, it, may, it may end up happening. Um, <laughs> Jody Pico, it has been wonderful talking with you today, and thank you so much for coming on Think Again. It really has been my pleasure. Thank I've you. I've truly enjoyed it, and uh, for the audience, the book is Small Great Things, and I urge you to, I urge you, um, I, I, I feel like I can't say, I, I feel like I have to say, if you're white, and... <laughs> no, but I don't think that's true, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, don't, I will say that, because I... I mean, would, as a result of our yeah. earlier conversation, right. I now feel I should... Well, it's really, <laughs> it's interesting you should say that, because I've heard from a lot of people of color, and what they're saying is, you know, what the best I could hope for, which is, this feels authentic, you did your homework, and I'm really touched that you even wanted to have this conversation. That's the best and the, the highest praise I could receive from a person of color. And I'll also say that you've written what is, I've read a bit about the white supremacy, supremacist movement in America, mm -hmm. and you've written a very convincing, mm -hmm. to me, white supremacist character who is probably interesting to anyone who is not a white supremacist and doesn't yeah, know anything about that. which we hope is many people. Yes. Right. <laughs> yeah. um, thank you so much for coming on. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate it. And that wraps up another episode of Think Again, a Big Think podcast. If you have three minutes and you're sitting at a computer and you want to do a nice thing for this show, I would greatly appreciate it if you would rate or review us. I read pretty much every review, every review, scratch that, every review that comes in. And some of them have directly influenced the things that I'm doing on the show. Thank you to the person who told me that it's good not to say right 600 times while I'm listening to somebody. And thank you to the other person who suggested that I let the guests start the conversation after the surprise clips. Working on that, working on that. Anyway, if you could rate us on you know, iTunes, Podbean, Google Play, Stitcher, Podcatcher, whatever you're listening to, wherever you're listening, that makes a very, very big difference to us. Also, uh, next week, I'm joined by the legendary Canadian novelist and short story writer and essayist, Margaret Atwood. It's a really, really interesting conversation. Hope to see you then.